Before we start today's show, I just wanted to mention our sponsor, Wealthify. Wealthify is regulated by the FCA and is a multi-award winning online and app-based investment service founded in 2016 and owned by Aviva with a simple mission to make investing accessible to everyone. You can invest from as little as one pound and Wealthify offers a number of investment products including a stocks and shares ISA, a general investment account and a personal pension. However, Wealthify also offers a junior ISA which allows parents to save for their child's future through investing. Wealthify also offers ethical junior ISAs and the ability for family and friends to pay directly into its junior ISA account for the child's benefit. In the run up to Christmas, this could provide a meaningful and eco-friendly alternative to present buying. With investing, your capital is at risk and you could get back less than you put in. For more information, head over to moneytothemasses.com and search Wealthify. Hello and welcome to episode 346 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm good, Andy. I'm so into Instagram stories at the moment that if you don't follow me on or Money to the Masses on Instagram, make sure you go and have a, a look because I'm getting slowly hooked onto it because what I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff on how we record things, just how we work, uh, my thoughts. I'm actually doing some different type of content i did 21 seconds i described uh interest rates inflation and uh the bank of england and economic growth on that did the uh, idea for the 21 seconds come first or was it 21 seconds and you thought we've got a perfect theme tune for this what the song you mean no it was it was it was a song first because i don't know why i thought oh let's do it in like 30 seconds and then i I don't know why 21 seconds and actually i don't know if you know this it's the it's the song by so solid crew yeah 21 seconds very much our era by the way like very much. Showing our age. <laughs> but did you know i mean I, this shows you the sort of sad thing i would do i once sat there and timed each of the people in it and they do only rap for 21 seconds each well wow. exactly yeah. if you go through so i kind of thought about <laughs> it anyway i did i did something like that so instagram stories is something that i'm slowly falling in love with to be honest and getting quite into so we're putting a lot of content behind the scenes stuff as well and it really brings out the character of the brand so I'm buzzing about that, Andy. So do go and have a look at that. And it's worth going on there because we share, probably we share too much because on Friday we did the Money to the Masses quiz. Anyone who goes onto Instagram will, will have seen we do the Friday quizzes. They're very, very popular. And last week it was all about the podcast. So Damien and I very confidently strode in and uh, thought, right, well, this is our perfect opportunity to get that five out of five. Five multiple choice questions, mind you. So there's only four answers on each question. So five questions about the history of the podcast. Yeah. And uh, neither of us got five out of five. And and what was most embarrassing, one of the questions was, when did the podcast first start? And I was two years out. I mean, I was two years too late. We'd already been going two years longer than what I'd said. And when it came to how many podcast episodes had there been, and again, multiple choice, given that the guy sitting to my right edits every show, he (laughs) got the number of episodes incorrect. But anyway, go back and have a look at that because it is in a highlight, I think, on Instagram. So you can have a go at the weekly quiz. And quickly, before we move on to the main part of the podcast, I just wanted to briefly mentioned that next week's podcast that would usually come out on Sunday is actually coming out a few days early. We're going to be releasing it on Friday the 26th of November. Now the reason for that is it's Black Friday. Whether you like it or not, Black Friday does exist and we're going to invite on one of our good friends here at Money to the Masses, Jordan Cox, who does our deals on the Money to the Masses website. He's going to be coming in and onto the show to explain the best Black Friday deals. And the reason we're bringing the podcast out early obviously is black friday itself so it makes sense but it's because there are certain deals out there that are already known to a certain select few people and jordan is one of those people and they're under embargo which means they can't be talked about before the 26th of november so what we're going to do is we're going to record the podcast prior to the friday but then we're going to release it in a minute past midnight on the friday so if you are into black friday and you want to get yourself some of the best deals we'll be releasing those first thing on the friday morning and you can listen to those so it is the normal show it's just coming out a couple of days early and we'll be back to normal the following sunday right let's get on to this week's podcast and find out what's coming up on the show this week yeah we've got to get on because there's so much i've 
prepped the podcast and I've just realized there's so much content. So the first thing I'm going to do is it's a bit of a personal experience, but mixed with becoming financially free. The idea of getting rid of car finance and how you can do it. So most people are probably at some point on maybe a PCP deal where they've got a, a new car, they're paying a monthly amount for their car. And you just get stuck on this merry-go-round. And actually, it's one of the things that will stop you pretty much building wealth and being financially independent. The second piece was something that was brought to my attention about a rainy day fund and an emergency fund. Are they the same thing or different? Given that it's going to be a piece on the podcast, there's an argument that they are two different things. Because I wrote about it on the uh, Instagram story this week, and it raised the interesting point is, is there a difference between a rainy day fund and an emergency fund? Something which, uh, obviously, we promote quite a lot on this podcast and encourage people to build and finally a question from a listener is about bonds and equities and they want me to explain the correlation between the two because they don't quite understand it so we're going to do that as the investment piece right let's start with the car finance piece then how to get away from that merry-go-round and and hopefully build wealth and get yourself financially independent what have we got So this piece is slightly born out of some personal experience but I wanted to share with people now If you go back to podcast 322, we did a whole show or section of the show about car finance. So most people probably go and buy a new car via car finance at some point. Now, personally, I've had cars on finance. Now, if we go back, say, about 14 so years ago, Just as my first daughter was born, I needed a car and I did the sensible thing, went out and got a second-hand car. I didn't have monthly payments to pay on the car. I had saved up the money, bought a second-hand car, five years old, and then I ran it into the ground for the next seven years. And by the time I did that, the thing was falling apart. And what happened after that, I had to get another car, obviously. But with an old car, I I made a decision. We had another child and the reliability of the second-hand car had completely diminished. The concept of putting my family going into an old car, and I didn't have the expertise or the time to go and look for a new second-hand car, sometimes just throwing money at a problem seems a sensible option. So I went and got back on the merry-go-round of a PCP deal, which is a personal contract purchase deal. Now, there are different ways of buying a new car. And of course, the reason I wanted a new car And the reason my wife wanted a new car was because of the reliability of it, the safety of it, and we could pick the car that we wanted. So there was a lot of reasons. And let's be quite frank, some of the deals that you could get on cars can be very attractive. So what normally happens, I'm not going to focus on all the different types, but you can get higher purchase types of finance. You can get PCP, which is personal contract purchase, and you can get personal contract hire. Now, I am focusing on PCP here. And what happens with that, you normally put down an amount of money as a a deposit up front. You then agree to have a balloon payment at the end of, say, a three-year window, can be up to five years. And you pay monthly installments that are agreed from outset at a set rate. And all of the numbers are calculated based on a set of assumptions that the car is going to come back with a set mileage that you're going to do a year in an agreed condition. So let's just use an example. You might buy a car for... £20,000, you might end up financing probably about £18,000 of that, and you've paid £2,000 as an initial deposit. You then end up paying £200 a month for that car. At the end of the, say, three years, you have choices whether you just give the car back and walk away, or you might, for example, decide that you want to buy it outright. If you want to buy it outright, then you have to pay off the finance at the end, and it'll be this large balloon payment, which will be something like, say, £12,000. And then you pay that and you can own the car, or of course, you can go back on the merry-go-round. There might be some equity in the car, i.e. it's worth more than what the finance is left on the car, and you use that against a new car, and you go around again and again and again. And of course, they love that in the motoring world, because they have then got you on this merry-go-round of paying two to three hundred pound a month for a car so that's pcp now if you go back to episode 327 of this podcast if you really want to become financially independent which was the theme of that podcast one of the biggest things you can do to make that more likely so financial independence means that you are going to get to a point in life where you won't have to work you can choose whether to work and you have much more flexibility if you want to get to the point where you reach financial independence or just build wealth one of the biggest things you can do is get rid of car payments and you can take that money save that money invest that money and grow your wealth because think about it when you pay for a car on finance you are effectively funding and financing 
depreciation of that asset over and over and over again. Because when you buy the car, like an example I said, that's worth £20,000, as soon as you drive it off the forecourt, you've lost thousands overnight. And then when you get the next new car on this merry-go-round, you basically are constantly financing a depreciating asset. And so at some point, you need to get off that merry-go-round and actually not have this 200 to 300 pound a month or even more in a lot of cases i mean i'm being quite reserved in the type of car but some people will have huge cars that cost them much more than that a month and that amount of money could be being put to better use rather than you effectively being fleeced by the car companies now as i said i'm going to focus on pcp in this episode so how do you get off the merry-go-round and actually get rid of that financing because i have just done this okay so this is one of the reasons i'm talking about it like i said i had a pcp deal like most people's most popular option in the uk and i need to get off of that to be able to own cars again and not have to pay this monthly amount over and over again now if you are in a pcp deal then of course there are certain rules that exist that protect you so if you've paid more than 50 percent of the total amount payable on the agreement and that includes interest and fees you can voluntarily terminate a pcp contract which is a legal right under section 99 of the consumer credit act and you effectively hand the car back and the amount that is the 50 percent is stated in your agreement that's not what this show is about really that is really beneficial for people who are struggling to meet the monthly payments so if you're that person out there and you're struggling to meet your monthly payments but you have paid beyond that 50 percent figure which again look at your agreements you do have options but of course the positive is that if you give a car back and you do voluntarily terminate an agreement early you don't have any more monthly payments you could go and buy a cheaper second-hand car possibly and i say possibly because as we go on to the cost of second-hand cars are going through the roof and it's better than missing a payment on a on a car agreement because if you do that it's going to impact your credit file now technically if you do terminate a contract it shouldn't impact your credit rating of course if you keep terminating contracts early it costs car companies money because they're expecting it to be financed for the full term and therefore in future you may find it more difficult to get a finance agreement on a car because you keep terminating it but this is about trying to get off of that merry-go-round of course you aren't going to have a car that's one of the cons and you will technically if there are damages to the car or if you had excess mileage beyond what was agreed on the contract at outset then there can be charges but what i'm thinking of is that if you are coping with paying the car finance then you're going to get to a point at the end of maybe your agreed term three years or even a bit before that because you can pay and clear a finance agreement early then if the value of the car is greater than the remaining payments then you may be better off settling the finance early it's always an option now you will become the legal owner of that car once you've paid the payments because don't forget under a pcp deal you don't technically own the car until you've made all the payments including that balloon payment including that balloon payment and once you've paid that you then have a choice of what you want to do with the car and in theory you could then sell the car and if it's worth more than what was owed on the finance then you've got a bit of equity and of course some people might be sitting there thinking yeah but these deals are tied up in a way that they are supposed to be almost equal at the point that you would return the car potentially now you could argue that it also makes sense to settle the finance if the cost of carrying on payments is greater than the settlement figure and i mean that might happen for some people But the most important thing, there is a chance to get out of a PCP car finance merry-go-round. And the stars have almost aligned at the moment to make it a very good time to try and get off of this merry-go-round, which is why I'm talking about today. So I'm going to give you some examples, real-life examples, numbers, to illustrate my point. So if you go back to 2016 or take a typical car, Kia Sportage family car, you would have bought that car for the same price you would have bought it in 2019, okay? Now... That car would have been worth probably the basic model about 21 and a half grand. If you had financed after paying down a two grand deposit, you financed about 19 and a half grand, your monthly payments would have been £240 a month. That's if you took it out in 2016 or 2019 and the same cars, if you'd entered into agreements on those two different dates, that's what I'm comparing. And this is based on a mileage of about 8,000 miles a year, a bit lower than the average, but this is what keeps the value of the car up when you get to the end of the agreement. And so therefore the final balloon payments would be in both these instances about 12 and a half grand. But where this gets interesting is if you go back to 2019, so you've done the first agreement in 2016 three years later the value of the car at that point 
was on and around that £12,500 for the final payment, the equivalent value of that, because that's if you'd kept in line with your agreement in terms of mileage and the conditions. What is blowing my mind right now when I'm looking at this stuff is if you had to guess how much that car is worth equivalent. So you'd done the same thing. You took a finance out on a new car in 2019. We're just about to approach coming to the third year as we hit 2022. How much do you think the car is going to be worth now? And the answer, because I've done the research, is between 18,000 and 19,000 pounds. That is mind boggling. So the same scenario, three years later, the difference in the car value is that it's going to be between 18 and 19,000. You only financed 19 and a half grand on the car nearly three years ago. So what we've got now, and the reason this is occurring because of the chip shortage that is in cars at the moment, anybody who you know has tried to buy a new car is telling you that they can't get the new car, they've got to wait six months for it to be delivered. But equally, it's causing the used car prices to go through the roof. And I'll just quote a headline that was in This Is Money just in the last month. And the headline is average used car prices saw 24% to more than £19,000. And now 70% of one-year-old models are being advertised above their brand new list prices. So this is a reality. And I've been looking at my own car and I'm thinking, surely not. And this is true. And so you are in an environment where you could, in theory, settle that car and you own it, you'd actually have about £6,000, £7,000 in your pocket if you just sold it on to someone else. You've actually got equity in that car. That's un- really unheard of. And it's because of the pandemic and the scenario that we're in. Now, if you think that you have bought a car, and like I've been planning to get out of my PCP deal for a long time. So I bought a car that had a very long warranty on it because I'm sitting there thinking, well, I kind of want that. One of the benefits of new cars, you get warranties on them. But if I eventually own it and I'm the only owner of it, then I still want that warranty if I eventually decide to buy it. And so by planning ahead and getting that, I've got the new car kind of concept with a car that I've I've driven, very low mileage, but with a warranty on it. When I paid off the finance, and I have paid off the finance on the car, I chose to do that. So in theory, the other thing you could do is you could take that £6,000 and actually go and buy a, a second-hand car if you wanted to, and so you don't have any more payments. Yes, the only thing, I'll come back to that, is that the used car that you're going to buy for £6,000 is not going to be as good as the used car would have been for £6,000, say, three years ago. That is a, a given. But you've got to think about the other options that are out there. So what would happen if you got to the end of your PCP contract and you thought, I, I don't want to get into a new one, so I want to try and own this car? Now, you could get a car loan. So you can get loans that go for as much as five years. They won't typically go longer because the car will basically not exist. And I looked at the numbers for £12,500, you could get a 5% loan over, say, five years. Even if you did it over longer than that, you could be looking at payments of similar levels of £223 a month. And it would be at a rate of about 2.8% a year now the average car finance is four to seven percent on a pcp deal so that is a decent deal on that loan to pay off that pcp balloon payment if you took out finance you're still paying about 220 pound a month and you're still doing it for the next five years now if you do that the amount of interest you pay on the 12 and a half grand equates to about 898 pounds but overall on that 12 and a half grand which you've refinanced into a short-term loan that would mean you'd pay 898 pounds interest now It is possible to remortgage to clear debt, okay? We've got articles on the website. Now, there are, again, big caveats around doing this. It's not ideal because you technically turn an unsecured debt into a secure debt, i.e. it's on your house. So that's something you have to bear in mind. And really, the advice out there is if you end up consolidating any debt in any way, you should really only ever do it once because otherwise it becomes habitual. You start just keep accruing debt onto your house and that is a, a slippery slope. But the other thing I would say is that you could technically might be able to get some cheaper finance elsewhere, maybe, I don't know, 0% cheaper alternatives like balance transfer credit cards or something that have a 0% offer. That's what I did. I mean, I'm quite happy to openly admit I did a balance transfer credit card or a money transfer credit card, put the money into my account, paid off the car, and uh, I paid 1.7% in a fee as opposed to 5%. So it worked for me. You're bang on. And I mean, 
money transfer credit cards. It's good that you gave that example there, Andy. But the thing is, you're also going to be paying that debt off over 25 years. If you do decide to remortgage because your mortgage is coming up for renewal, then you will pay more interest on a pounds and pence basis. And I want to give people an example again. So going back to my 12 and a half grand that you've got, you need to pay off this car if you want to then own it and get off the merry-go-round of PCP. Then if you were to remortgage currently and you were going to include that onto your mortgage and it was a two-year fixed deal, given the rates are out there about 1.19% at the moment, then you would end up adding about £48 a month onto your mortgage. And that's very different to the £240 a month you were paying under the PCP deal. But of course, that's going to be for a longer period of time. Now, how much interest do you pay extra by doing that? And actually, the amount that you would pay is £1,958 total in interest, which is just over £1,000 more than if you'd gone down the short-term loan route. So if you'd gone down a short-term loan, for five years, you would have ended up paying £898 in extra interest on that twelve and a half grand. If you'd remortgaged, you'd end up paying £1,958. Now, some people might think it's worth it. The differential, the reason that it isn't as high in interest as you might have thought is because it's a lower rate on your mortgage, but it's over a longer period of time. So what I'm trying to tell people here is I'm not telling people to go and remortgage debt. And I'm not telling people that it's necessarily the best idea, but there are options that people need to think about. At some point, you really want to try and not be on the PCP merry-go-round or the car finance merry-go-round. Now, something that I was able to do, and I don't mind sharing this because it's all about personal stories. As somebody pointed out on the Instagram this week when I said we did a competition, gave away a mug, what do you love about money to the masses? And they say it's the personal stories. So I had planned to try and get rid of my PCP deal. So what I also did was when I moved house, I was very conscious that at some point in the very near future, I was going to have this amount of money due. So therefore, in the financing of buying my new house and selling my old house and with the equity, I was conscious that I would really be keen to see if I could maximize in terms of what I got from my house and the limit what I paid for the house I was going to, to be able to have cash that could clear that debt, because that meant that freed me up. And that's a lot of money a month. And if you get that money, and you redirect it into somewhere else. So for example, if you wanted to invest that £240 a month payments that I talked about in my example, over 10 years, you would have £37,600 at the end of it. And that's at a 5% assumed growth rate. If you've got a growth rate of 8%, you'd have 44500 So you can see the magic that happens there by getting off this merry-go-round, by planning ahead and then taking that money that you would have been paying on the deal and investing it and putting it aside, then you accelerate your journey towards financial independence or financial freedom. Now, to summarise, the reason why I thought this was a good piece of the podcast is we're in a period where cars have very good warranties on them. We are in a market where second-hand car prices are going up. I mean, I don't ever remember seeing that pretty much in my adult lifetime. And they are expensive to replace. If I wanted to go and buy my equivalent car in the open market, I'd have to pay much more. So why would I want to do that or get a new deal? And at the moment interest rates both on mortgages and loans are still towards record lows because interest rates haven't risen yet and they are going to now there are assumptions in all of this that i've said which will be that yes if you did somehow consolidate your debt into a remortgage then you've got to assume that you're always going to get that low rate forever and a day and that won't necessarily be the case yes you've got to get another car in the future at some point because your car won't last forever but If you are taking those monthly payments and you are investing and putting them aside and you are budgeting for the idea that you might have to buy a car in the future, you may be able to take some of the money from your investments to pay for a car in the future or you may be able to save up in another way a pot of money to pay for a car. You might not even need a car. So now is a good time. Plan ahead and if you can have a life event like moving house, maybe inheritance or something that can help you get off that wheel. It might feel a little bit galling to pay over money like a car, a significant sum. But at the end of the day, it's the only way you're going to get off of this merry-go-round unless you just hand the car back. Okay, then. So rainy day and emergency funds, are they the same thing? Are they different? And what is the difference? Now, this is interesting because you, you can have an element that it's that kind of tomato, tomato. But 
there can be a difference between a rainy day fund and an emergency fund. And this was something that I started to think about because I did a piece on Instagram stories, which borrowed from Squid Game to talk about rainy day funds. And actually, I used the word rainy, rainy day in there because the, the, the image that I used had him holding a cookie that had an umbrella. If you've watched the program you'll know the bit the game that i'm talking about and so it kind of it worked rather than the word emergency fund and is there a difference between the two because we then had a discussion and technically there can be now an emergency fund we've talked about in the podcast and we encourage people to say say up to three months at least of their salary you get definitions that can be of your outgoings but three to six months worth is a good steer Post-pandemic, there are ideas of having at least 12 months because obviously a lot of us know that businesses collapse, we lost jobs. Now, I mentioned episode 327 earlier on of this podcast, and in there I talk about the steps of financial independence and emergency funds and the funding of them are a core part of that sequence. So go back and listen to it. It's a very succinct piece. But I also, there are some notes on that one. We did do a, a transcript, so you can just read through and skim through the plan that I set out in that particular podcast. But the emergency fund is there for like catastrophes, like you lose your job or you might end up becoming long-term sick or something like that. And the pandemic was a brilliant example of why you'd want an emergency fund and why you need one. And the good thing about the pandemic, if there was anything that was positive, a silver lining on that very dark cloud, was the fact that it encouraged people to now start to think about emergency funds. But a rainy day fund could technically be something slightly different and it tends to be intended for smaller unintended expenses so let's just say i don't know the clutch went on your car it doesn't fit into your budgets when you're budgeting it month to month but it isn't going to derail your finances if you have a small pot of money let's say it could be a thousand pounds that you can pull out of that fund and pay for that thing on your car to be fixed and therefore it becomes an inconvenience rather than an emergency or a complete disaster in your life now the key thing of a rainy day fund is that it avoids you going into debt and dave ramsey who i talk about on that podcast episode that past podcast episode is a well-known american finance expert uh, radio dj whatever you want to call him and he's got a real thing about emergency funds and one of the first steps he says for anybody he talks about baby steps is to save up a thousand dollars we can call it a thousand pounds in the uk the figure is not overly important it just has to be sizable enough that it's going to cover most unexpected bills so he says the first thing you do is save up a thousand pounds before you clear debt now ordinarily you most people would suggest you clear debt before you get an emergency fund because you want to break that link of using debt you need to get rid of it because you're paying a lot of money to service that debt He has a view that you save up a thousand pounds first, that stops you using debt if there's an emergency, and then you just focus on clearing your debt. And then when you've cleared your debt, you then start building an emergency fund of three to six months salary, as I mentioned. Now, if you have an emergency in between, say, like I said, the clutch goes on your car, you dip into your thousand pound, he doesn't call it a rainy day fund, he just calls it an emergency fund. It's like the starter part before you build it up later. And then you take that money, you pay for that emergency and you don't use debt so you break that cycle of using debt and then you go about trying to build that back up to the thousand pounds before you carry on with clearing your debt or eventually building a a a bigger emergency fund now he doesn't distinguish between the two as such once you get to a certain stage, you don't have that thousand pounds separate. From when I've looked at his stuff, it just then becomes one big emergency fund. But would I have both is, I suppose, the question. And I can see some logic in having a rainy day fund, calling it something different, and your emergency fund, because the rainy day fund, as I said, stops you getting into debt. And for some people, that works. A lot of money is idiosyncratic. It's about your own psychology. What's going to stop you reverting back to where you were before? Think of it like the nicotine patch for debt. If you have a rainy day fund, £1,000 that's separate from your rest of your emergency fund that you use for those things like the clutch going on your car, the emergencies that are unplanned, then if that stops you getting back into debt, then that could be a good thing. And it stops you then breaking into your emergency fund, which for some people could be a vicious circle where they then start breaking into it more and more frequently. So it is a nice concept. You could have a rainy day fund and an emergency fund. Now, if you use things like Moneybox or 
there are other apps out there. I've linked to the show notes about these apps that can do roundups. So you can put your spare change into a side pot. I use one of them. And in the space of about 18 months, I've saved £600 into a pot of money. Now, that only works by rounding the spare change. Every time my wife and I go into the shops, it might round up, say, 20p, put it into the savings pot. Don't think about it. That's kind of making a rainy day fund on the side, even though I have an emergency fund. And that can be called upon for something that is like the clutch going on the car. So there are ways of building up these smaller pots if you want to so the message of this part of the pod is it doesn't really matter if you've got an emergency fund and or rainy day fund but whatever increases your chances of success that stops you using debt stops you raiding those funds then that's what works best and i would suggest that you do think of it like the savings pots you see on some of these things like uh, monzo or starling like them but the concept we talked about previously on the podcast when you're trying to encourage children to save for the future you get three envelopes you get them to put some of their pocket money in one envelope which is for the now to go and spend one that's for like a short-term savings plan which might be something they want for um, save up to buy something in the next couple of months and a third envelope where they put some money for a longer term savings goal which would be something way off in the future that they might want all that's doing is giving different names segregating your savings habits your pots and really this is all that's doing with emergency funds so i quite like it for some people it might work quite well to have a rainy day fund and a separate emergency fund but something to think about okay and so for the next piece of the pod we're going to be talking about the relationship between bonds and equities and this came about from a question from one of the listeners who contacted Damien. I'll read the message out. It says, Damien, although I'm an experienced investor, I struggle to understand the bond market and the correlation with equity markets. Is there an easy way to explain this subject at a simple level that I would certainly benefit from? Thanks again for your excellent content. So Damien, bonds and equities, we need an easy way to understand the correlation. Yeah, I suppose the very simple thing you should think about is that when shares go up, so stock markets go up, bonds tend to go down. Okay. Now that is the simple takeaway that you could go off with. And that's why you want to diversify a portfolio. And people do quite frequently have what they call a long equity bond portfolios where basically they have some equities in their portfolio, which will hopefully go up when the economy is booming and the company's profit margins are great and earnings and therefore the share prices go up but equally in that environment bonds won't necessarily do as well because the fixed income the fixed return you get on a bond is less attractive in that environment and so they tend to maybe fall in value and so therefore they offset each other and on the flip side in an environment where the economy is struggling then companies' earnings could be hit, then shares will tend to underperform. Bonds, where bonds might do well because suddenly that reliability of a fixed income is a positive. So it's that's the idea. Now, that is very simple and simplistic idea because the reality is it doesn't really work like that all the time. So I can give you a simple answer, but the simple answer is the relationship varies. And it depends. So the basis of like portfolio construction is that equity and bonds are meant to have a slight negative correlation, which means that when one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. That's the simple idea. And that happens a lot of the time. And just to reiterate to people, a share is obviously a stake in the company. So when the company does well, the value of that share will go up and you can get dividends. So that will tend to do better in a, an environment where obviously company owners are going up. So that normally means when the economic cycle is very positive, we're tending to see economic growth. You maybe see a bit of inflation, whereas bonds are actually loans to companies. So it's like giving a loan to a company where you get an agreed regular interest payment every year, for example, and then you get the money back the original principle at the end but bonds these loans are called bonds because you can sell them on basically the second hand market you don't really see that because you probably buy a bond fund but bonds then change hands so these loans do but of course in an environment where interest rates are likely to go up which could be an environment like we're in now then bonds don't seem as attractive because the rate you're going to get is going to be by comparison worse when rates go up, so when the Bank of England starts raising interest rates, then it was 
in a low interest rate environment like we are currently in now or have been in the past. So therefore, people don't want bonds, they'll sell them and they'll buy equity. So that's the concept. But that relationship does vary. That's the problem. And so from a very basic portfolio construction, yes, you think they will move in opposite directions, that negative correlation. But you will see periods of time, we've seen it in recent months, which is why this period of investing, especially in the last decade or so, but in the last two years has been interesting, in particular with the pandemic, you get periods of time where they will both go up in value. So stocks and bonds go up at the same time. Now, why would that happen? It doesn't seem to be logical based on what I said. Then the reason is it could be too much money chasing those assets. So QE, where the central banks print money, in inverted commas, we're not going to delve into details. But if you have lots of money chasing a limited number of assets, then it tends to push prices up of those assets. And don't forget the way QE works. It's effectively bond buying as well. So that's why it drives up the prices of bonds. Now, with equity markets, then that liquidity eventually finds its way into those assets too. So stock markets start to go up. And that's why you get this distortion in markets. And that's why you sometimes hear about people saying that markets are distorted and keep predicting things are going to collapse. And why when the central banks start removing that liquidity, which means raising interest rates or unwinding their bond buying QE programs, that you might get something happen that could be significant. And when we've had periods where they've threatened to do that, and when I say threaten, it's not like they're trying to sort of like you're a naughty child telling you off, but the fact is they're trying to get us back to normal, like a patient that's been given a drug that's put them into a coma for their own benefit, you've got to try and wean them off it and bring them back to life effectively and out of that coma that's what central banks have got to do but you could get a nasty shock when that happens it could send things backwards another reason why they could be both going up at the same time is because you just got two groups of investors who have got completely different views so one group are very much hurrah the world's going to be amazing and economic growth is going to be superb we're buying equities yeah you chase that dream and then you've got another bunch who are like the world's about to collapse this is like this is this is all going to go completely wrong and they're fearful and they'll start buying bonds and you do get that and you'll see those narratives change over time and go back to September this year and we saw both stocks and bonds fall at the same time and then you think well why would that happen well that can be when everybody's panic selling and they just go into cash and they just think the world's going to end and the markets are falling but at the moment what's been driving it is because of inflation and Markets started getting a bit spooked that inflation was going to run away with itself. So they didn't think that the companies could pass on that rising costs to their customers. So therefore, it would impact their earnings. So the stock prices would start started falling. But also in an inflationary environment, bonds don't do very well. So people started selling those as well. So the correlations vary over time. And I've read quite a bit about the concept that the typical 60-40, 60% equity, 40% bond portfolio is dead, or at least the annualised expected future returns are going to be lower, perhaps around about 3% a year rather than 5% a year in the next decade. So hopefully I've explained there the correlation between bonds and equities. One thing I just want to mention before I finish is that I know it's something that within the team we have a lot of conversations about, which is bond yields and equities. Now, when you read something like the Financial Times or you read things in other newspapers, but when you read something like in the Financial Times, you will see something that will talk about bond yields going up. And we focus on the yields going up and what that relation to equities. The problem you have is that people therefore confuse that with bond prices, but it's not the same thing. The way bonds are priced is that when the value of the bond, so how much you'd pay, goes up, the yield of that bond falls. So I'm not going to go into why that occurs, but when you see, you best try and convert it into one or the other in your head. So when you read an article that said bond yields spike, in your head flip it to bond prices tumble. Because then you'll understand that when the bond yields spike and they rise in, you're thinking, right, bonds are falling. So people are selling bonds and the supply is outstripping demand. And therefore, in that environment, you would probably expect maybe equities to maybe go up. Because the thing is, if you're trying to operate in bond prices, bond yields and equity prices yes. it gets confusing Muddied, yeah. and, and when we do stuff in the office i'm often having to try and change it around and explain to people so always convert back if you read bond yields and you prefer thinking about bond prices 
convert it back to bond prices in your head and do the opposite. And then you can relate that to equities. And that very simple relationship of equities and bond prices should be moving in opposite directions as a basis of your understanding. Then when they're not, what you do is you go, why is that relationship not working? There must be something going on here. And then you can read into it a bit more and look into it. So there you go. Hopefully I've helped explain that and not confused you further. You must have explained it well because I got it. Another thing that confuses me with this whole world of stocks and bonds is the fact that stocks, equities and shares are all the same thing. Effectively, just interchangeable words for all intents and purposes. So again, it's one of those things you read something and you can interpret it in different ways. But this is one of the reasons about going back just quickly before we finish on the whole bond and equities because in a world that's being influenced by central banks massively that it pays to diversify beyond equities and bonds because other things like gold for example some people have in portfolios some people are now looking at things like cryptocurrency like bitcoin some people looking at commodities other commodities i should say rather than gold as well to try and diversify a portfolio property for example, REIT, all these things can help diversify portfolios. You're not just obsessing about what bonds and equities are doing. Right. So that's it. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so in the usual way. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter, it's at money to the masses with the number two. Again, get on Instagram, all about the stories at the moment. You can get an insight into behind the scenes at Money to the Masses and actually behind the scenes at Damien Fay HQ because it's not all work. Last week, we learned that Damien's got a particular penchant for uh, midget gems and he was disgusted <laughs> with himself. Um, so to get onto Instagram, follow us on there. It helps as well because we can share what we do here at Money to the masses to the world and also i'd just like to add it's a very good way of directly influencing what's on the podcast and i give away mugs too so if there's nothing else we, we tend to give away mugs and so that's it for this week until next time until next time oh.